right, we're in Matthew chapter 13. In fact, we're going to end up the very last little paragraph of chapter 12 in just a moment. The 12th chapter of Matthew that we looked at last week, Jesus went head to head with the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, these scribes, these teachers of the law that knew the, the law, the rules of, of God so well. And Jesus butted heads with them big time. They had conflict over what could be done on the Sabbath, even to the point of Jesus healing a man's hand and he was called on the carpet for working on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath and healing was work. And then they even said that Jesus was doing his miracles by the power of Satan. And that was horrible. That was blasphemy. And Jesus says, if you attribute Satan as my father, the deal's over. There's no hope. <coughs> and finally, they said, Jesus, show us a miracle. Do us a trick and we'll believe. And he says, no. And a wicked and adulterous, generations, adulterous generation asks for a sign. The only sign you're going to see is the sign of Jonah that was in the belly of the whale for three days and I'll be in the belly of the earth for three days. But he calls them an adulterous generation. And that means that they're unfaithful. <clears throat> that means they're unable to keep a covenant. We know what that word means in our marriage covenant. Being unfaithful. And that's a, an idea that is throughout the Old Testament. Israel was unfaithful to God. And they were called an adulterous nation. So now, this morning, at the very end of chapter 12, we see Jesus dealing with his family. <coughs> it seems a little, a little brisk, almost disrespectful to his family, but let's, let's read this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. <clears throat> While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied to him, who is my, bro my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We would think that Jesus seems a little disrespectful to his mother, to his brother, his brothers. Yet, as we see elsewhere, we understand that, see, Jesus' brothers didn't really believe that he was Messiah at this time. Now, they did after the resurrection, yes. But it says elsewhere that Jesus' family thought at times Jesus was out of his mind. He was beside himself. They were worried about him. And so... Jesus' family was struggling with who he was spiritually. Now, for me, I would doubt that his mother Mary ever doubted. Because you know a mother's instinct. And you know that Mary was approached by the angel. And you know what Mary heard in, in the announcement of, that she would have a, a son. And so I never for a moment think his mother doubted. But Jesus' brother and sister probably doubted who Jesus was until after the resurrection. But I think Jesus is pointing out that, look, your lineage, your pedigree, 
your family history genetically doesn't make you right with God. We're sons, daughters of God based on what? Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my family. And I think this is what he's trying to point out again to these Jews. It's not who you are, but it's who you believe in. And then, <coughs> another time, someone yells out to Jesus, Jesus, blessed be your mother. And he says, no, instead, blessed is he who does the will of my father. That's important. So I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. It's not our past. It's not our family. But do we serve God? Okay. Let's go on to chapter 13. Uh, Sir. Let me say something. <clears throat> I would like to use our friend Martha Gordon as an example. I think she'll let me do that. Okay. Years ago, I was talking to Martha, and she was upset about something. And I reminded her of who we are. I'm a brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. and she's a mother of Jesus. And she couldn't take that. It's easier to say I'm a brother of Jesus, yes. or I'm his sister. To say I'm the mother of Jesus, that's hard on any woman to say. And you, you, you have to reject it. And it's harder for a woman to have this relationship. It's easy for a man to say I'm a brother of Jesus. It's hard for a woman to say, I'm the mother of Jesus. And so Jesus comes along and says, if you can take it, if you can believe it, believe it. I don't know why a woman can do that. And that must be a, a struggle for any woman, and maybe some woman today wants to tell us how to, how to do that. Can we hear from any woman who would <laughs> say, I'm the mother of Jesus? No, you can't say that. You can't you take, say that, yes. You, you, you take that by faith. Yes. There are some things that, several things in the scriptures that are greater than we can grapple with, greater than we can understand, greater than we can get a hold of. Yes. Jesus said, you don't have to understand it, just accept it yes. and go on. Yes. And so I used Martha. Okay. She's one of our favorites as an example. Yes. Thank you. We know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at the foot of the cross, watching her son die. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Chapter 13. Jesus now begins to speak in parables. And we all know a little bit about parables. We've heard about them all their life, uh, all of our lives. We we have a, a nice little saying about a parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Simple enough. But Jesus uses everyday common examples to teach a spiritual, a moral truth. And this is brilliant. It's brilliant. It's down to earth. And yet it can be over our heads. As John just said, there's things we just cannot understand fully. And here's Jesus now beginning to teach. And we see him connect with people. And our first little parable here is the parable of the sower. The guy sowing the seed. This is one we've known for a long time. It's very, very simple. And if I were to ask you, okay, what parable first comes to mind when you think of a parable of Jesus? A lot of us would have said, well, the parable of the sower. It's simple. It's obvious. It's on its face. We can figure it out. And if I were to announce uh, 
for uh, worship time. Today's sermon is going to be the parable of the sower. Some of us would roll our eyes and say, well, we've already heard that. We know that. What's new about that? But the parable of the sower is the beginning now of Jesus' teachings. And you know what? The people didn't get it. They did not connect the dots. Jesus had to explain it to them. And we'll see this. This is, this is quite interesting. Chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. And such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow a seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. There they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right, Jesus tells this little parable, something that every one of them had probably either done or seen done. That's the way they had to sow. We've seen the picture of the, the man with the pouch over his shoulder. He takes the seed and throws it out. That's the way they had to do. It wasn't very accurate, but that was broadcasting the seed and obviously some fell along the path the birds came got it some fell in very rocky ground didn't have much soil to grow in others got in the weed patches and the weeds choked them out and all that we understand that <coughs> when Jesus finished this little parable he said now if you have ears to hear let them hear which really means figure it out Listen up. Pay attention. Did, did you hear me here? And he asked us to do that. And the disciples, as we'll see in the next verse, didn't get it. Let's read verses 10 and follow. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Now why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the kingdom of the secrets, <clears throat> I'm sorry, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of, of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, <clears throat> blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. <clears throat> For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. <clears throat> when the disciples said, Jesus, why do you speak in parables to these people? It was sort of their veiled way of asking to explain it to us. We don't get it either. 
tell us why you speak this way and maybe you know we'll understand a little bit better so Jesus says well you're special you have a special relationship with me you're my, my close associates here you're with me you get to see me you get to hear me you get to follow me and so you can understand these things and I think Jesus is being very, very generous almost tongue, tongue in cheek when he says now you, you understand all this stuff right and, and I'm sure they sort of said oh yeah yeah we, yeah we do maybe but he says if you are seeking if you're learning if you're someone I believe that's uh, hungry and thirsting after righteousness Jesus says God's going to help you understand it and accept it and learn from it but you'll have even more he says and if you don't that is if you reject God don't want to hear it don't care about it I can hear but I can't understand I see but I don't really perceive you would just want to close your mind and your eyes that's fine too God will let you go God will give it up for you he says this is what we're doing here we have people that claim to be so righteous and so good and yet they can't really see what's going on and they claim to be hearers but they don't really want to hear. And he, and, he, and, he, and he speaks from Isaiah. And that's some of the messages of the Old Testament prophets. Just like Jesus was so disappointed in the reception and the lack of faith that his hearers had, likewise in the Old Testament, those prophets were so disappointed. And over and over, they just pounded their heads to say, Listen, people, God's speaking to you. Hear it. Turn, and God will heal you. That's, that's the whole point. God wants to help us, but you reject him. And he quotes from Isaiah about this people that hear but don't really hear and see but don't really see. And he says, your hearts are hardened, your hearts are calloused, your eyes are closed. Otherwise, God would turn and heal you if you could accept it. And you know, the people that Jesus had just dealt with, they wanted to see a sign, do us a magic trick, Jesus, we'll believe. He said, no. We see over and over that people want to see if they want to see. And no one is as blind as he who will not see and Jesus has to struggle with this and previously Jesus had the example of people seeing the glories of Solomon's wisdom and just just bowing down in glory to God and he says somebody's greater than Solomon is here that's meaning himself and he says, you need to see, you need to understand, you need to perceive. And, it's, and in fact, he says, you know, there have been many righteous people through the years that have longed to see this revealed mystery that you're now seeing. But they didn't see it. They couldn't see it because it wasn't here. But now the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I believe we've heard now it's been revealed and Jesus sort of says you don't quite understand what you're seeing it's important it's important so why does he speak in parables is it be is it to be uh, a roadblock is it to be obtuse is it to be a, 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 a riddle is it to be uh, something like that well, let's, let's see as we go on. And Jesus explains this in just a moment. Spiritually minded people are going to get it. I think Jesus is trying to tell us. All right. Well, let me, let me pause there. Any, any comment or questions so far? Verse 18, Jesus says, here it is, plain and simple. This is what we're talking about. 
He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is a seed, seed that's sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. Trouble or persecution comes because of the world, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And this is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. The disciples needed this explanation and Jesus gave it. It's so simple. It's so obvious to us that we think, how could they have missed it? And I, it came home to me more so this week. The perversion of the message of God was so deep at this time that the impetus of following God was nothing more at this time than following a bunch of rules. The idea of a relationship with God had been lost. The idea of, of an interaction with God was lost. The idea, I believe, that would be called faith was lost. The Old Testament, yes, stories of faith and and walking with God and the righteous shall live by faith and yet by the time Jesus got here the perfect time for him to come in history as we know the Jewish interpreter said this is the rule about how we do things this is what you can do on Sunday you can only walk half a mile and if you take one step past half a mile God's gonna burn you and you can pick up 16 sticks on the Sabbath day to cook your bread for the Sabbath, but if you pick up 18, that's too many, and God's going to burn you. And then you can do this and this and this and this. And I see people that are burdened. And as Jesus says, it's just like putting burdens on the back of your back, and, you, and, and no one lifts you up to help you. But Jesus talks about his yoke being light and helpful. And I have to realize, I guess, that their relationship with God, as rough as it was, was nothing more than rule keeping, promoted by the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, the scribes. They were in charge, they kept the rules changing, and they kept the people knowledgeable about them being sinners. They could not keep it, and God's going to burn you. There's a list of rules over here. To be right with God, you better do them. But beyond that, there's a great person in the sky that's going to get you if you don't. Okay. The peril of the sower, he talks about hearing the word. Was the word about how far I can walk on the Sabbath? Or getting an ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath? No, the word was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I remember the Beatitudes. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Liberation. Freedom. I hear the message of the Sermon on the Mount. Of liberation. That's the word. That Jesus is talking about being sown in people's hearts. That there's a God that loves us and wants a relationship and then this idea of, oh yeah, Satan's there and he's going to try to nip us so we don't have faith. And there's going to be some shallow soil where we don't have very good roots. We struggle and we dry up and die. And there's going to be deceitfulness of the world and 
cares and weeds that just choke us out. But he says, if you hear the word and you let it grow, it produces many, many, many times the blessings that God has promised for us. And that's the story. And I hear that. And it thrills me. And I hope it thrills them. Now, if Jesus had said to these people, all right, people, listen up, hear the word of God, obey it and follow it, okay? You got that? See you. People would have said, okay, we're supposed to follow God. But he tells them this story about a sower, something we, they've all seen, all seen the weeds come up, all seen the shallow soil, all seen, all seen everything. Jesus connects that to accepting the word of God. And as these people walked home, I would assume if they're like me, I would be turning this over in my mind over and over again. That's right. Some seeds on the path and the birds just got it. Jesus says that's just like devil, the devil coming after us. I see it. Yeah. Okay. And, and here's some very rocky, shallow, gravelly soil that just, everything's just wilted and died. I see that. And as these people walk home, it begins to under, it, it begins to make sense. And so instead of Jesus just saying, all right, everybody, accept the word of God and follow him and see you later. Instead of that, he integrates it with life as a parable. And if they're like me, I need that to sort of get my mind around a concept that's so deep and yet so common. That's, that's what little I understand about the parable of the sower. Any com <clears throat> thought or comment here? Any comment? All right. Every time we read scripture, uh, new things are revealed, and this is wonderful. This is wonderful. All right. We'll go on to another parable, 24. And Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like. Okay, notice this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. <clears throat> and the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? <coughs> Where then did the weeds come from? The, an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat as well. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. All right. Here's another illustration that they understood. They knew that you want clean seed. Even today in our uh, economy, when I buy a bag of corn seed or wheat seed or cotton seed, it has purity. It says how many noxious weeds are in there, and it's got to be zero. We have seed laws to make sure we have pure seed. Back in this day, you try to do the best you can, have a clean field and everything, but weeds do get in there. And of course, the roots intergrow between the weeds and the grain, and then if you pulled up one, you'd pull up the other. That's, that's obvious. We, we know that. But something about God's judgment is coming up here. And Jesus is going to explain it 
in in just a moment. Uh, I tell you what, we're gonna we're gonna cheat just a moment. Let's let's run down to verse 36 because this is where he explains it. It, it makes sense to, to read the parable and have, have him explain it. So let's let's go to verse 36. They left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. <clears throat> the disciples did not get the meaning of this parable about the weeds being sown with the grain. He was asked by them, explain to this, us this parable. Whenever we think about Judgment Day, Whenever we think about the end times, we're, we have many scriptures in the New Testament that talk about this. You know, Jesus coming again and, and calling everything over with. The final day of judgment, giving account of our lives before God and, and all that. And so this makes sense to us. However, at this time, this was a little new for these people. You see, in the Old Testament, there was not a real idea of a great coming and cataclysmic end of the world and, and, and all of this as we have in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God's judgment was talked about judgment upon Israel or just judgment upon another country and a lot of times it was a, a physical judgment of a, another country you know, capturing them and hauling them off as slaves or, or whatever. The idea of ultimate spiritual judgment was, was not emphasized near like it is in the New Testament. When Jesus appears and he gives us some ideas that there will be an end and it's going to be unavoidable will be accountable. And I think Jesus is saying here, the kingdom of heaven is like this field. Meaning, in life, folks, we're going to have evil people around us. And they're going to be successful. They're going to grow well. And we're going to say, well, God, why are you letting these bad people succeed? And I think Jesus is saying, don't give up. Be patient. Uh, don't despair. In the end, they will be taken care of. Don't worry about it right now, but in the end, I'll take care of things. They will get their reward and you will get yours. So don't despair. So when we think about this, Jesus is trying to prepare his people about receiving the word, yes. And yes, Jesus, I'm with you. I believe, I serve you. But yet I see my society around me, and I don't know. I'm discouraged. And I think Jesus is trying to say, look, some will accept, some won't. You stay firm. You keep your roots in the ground, meaning faith in Jesus, and everything will be okay, even through the end, even 